aspiring to to do and achieve more as well. So how much further do you think you can push yourself before it sort of starts to become dangerous? Uh, well, safety, of course, is, is first and foremost in all of the planning and every swim. And you wouldn't go out with a pilot unless unless they perhaps you're convinced that they took safety as the highest priority. So that's yeah. one thing. But in order for them to keep you safe, you have to do all your work as well. You're going to do your bit. And so I, I'm sure if I had, if you take the Newcastle to Sydney swim, I don't know if you want to talk about that now or come back to it, but there are conditions that uh, I went through on that swim that had I not had to go through those, then I think I could have got further down the track. So that's not an excuse. I, I never make excuses. I own every part of a swim. But if I hadn't got stung so many times by blue bottles and my body built up such a reservoir of toxins from those, I think I would have been in better shape the next morning. The idea of delaying fatigue as much as you can, the idea of delaying um, the inevitable onset of hallucinations has to be pushed as far back as you can and then knowing how to deal with them when they come along. So I guess what I'm saying, the only way I'm going to find out my true limit is by having perfect conditions the way down, the best I can possibly get, uh, being able to fall into that micro-sleep mode, which for Newcastle I was never able to. And I was kind of counting on that because I was budgeting for a 40-hour swim and I, I would have found it really hard to push through to 40 because I hadn't had a sleep all that time. My mind hadn't had a chance to switch off even for if it was for a short time. So my answer is that I'll only know where that is once I have a good run into everything, I don't have to put up with jellyfish things. I can employ those little mechanisms that I've developed to myself. I can have time before a swim to put my head in the right place and consider what this swim may throw up to me and what other challenges I might have to put up with. Yeah, it's, it's quite funny how, you know, you'd hear someone say, oh, I could do that run in my sleep or like you, you're legitimately maintaining a stroke rate about 60 strokes per minute whilst you were asleep for 45 minutes. Do you have any any means of explaining that? Well, when I'm swimming, and I expect any long distance swimmer feels this as well, sometimes your head gets into a nice fuzzy sort of a, a zone. It's kind of like the twilight just before you fall asleep. Yeah. You just, if you're in good conditions, you're not battling big, heavy sublies or something, and you, your body's rocking as it should as you're rolling and turning with each stroke, uh, and you're just listening to your bubbles if you're with a paddler, a kayaker, a support team, you can give yourself over, you can let yourself fall asleep into that space. I don't know why, but I think it's worth a bit more study and a bit more questioning from academics, yeah. how you can continue to keep that same pace up, the same stroke rate of 64, that's my ideal, 64 strokes a minute, even when your brain is essentially switched off. And... Vlad was very surprised and delighted that his swimmer was almost unconscious but still keeping the stroke rate up. So it's a very positive thing to do. I don't think there was any added risk to doing that, um, but being able to access that is a huge yeah. thing. And how far can you go if you can have sleeps every now and then? It's not like you know uh, keeping awake with outside influences for two days in a row because that's really hard. But if you can just have these little breaks every now and then, I think you're in a very good position. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see kind of what sleep, what your sleep cycle looks like, I guess, within, the, you know, how deep or, or light that sleep is and, you know, the physiological benefits it provides you in terms of your, your performance as well. So, yeah, if there's any researchers, neuro, neurologists out there or anyone that wants to get into help. help. Yeah, <laughs> but, you know, it's lend your brain. Just a I spoke to some interesting people, like I spoke to people out of the military, how yeah. they deal with fatigue. I spoke to Phil Rush, who's a wonderful New Zealand swimmer, triple English channel crosser. You know, he's yeah. fast and furious. He's broken all sorts of, and he is Mr. Swimming in New Zealand. Um, we all agree that you can't build up a bank of sleep. Of course, you shouldn't start tired or fatigued, but you can't build up a bank of sleep and then spend that later on in the swim. But you can go in rested. You can go in prepared and there's a whole lot of different measures you can take to keep everybody as calm and cool around you so there's no surprises. And, of course, nobody recommends you get stung by jellyfish every 20 minutes because that does interrupt every one of your cycles. 
I'm really interested too. Do you have like a, a fear of sharks or, you know, marine creatures? Um, and how did these kind of like win, small wins you have, little victories along the way where you build up your, your confidence also applied to, I guess, being in an environment, an open environment um, where there are so many creatures that exist and in, inhabit the space that you're swimming in? I, in answer to your question, I don't have an irrational fear of sharks. And there is a big difference between respect yeah. for everything in the ocean and an irrational fear that's generated by television and gossip on the beach and, you know, politics. You know, I live on Coogee Beach and it's the same for your beaches where we have these uh, smart drum lines that catch and kill anything around the place that'll take a bait on a hook. And they're just, they're just killing everything all over the place. And that's an irrational response to an irrational fear. And the responses from the politicians, they're only 500 metres off the coast. We've got to swim past them in our morning swims. And, you know, that's a little bit off-putting as well. And, of course, the ancient technology of shark uh, nets are around our beach that just kill turtles and beautiful other marine animals, uh, all in the name of protecting tourists coming to Australia. It's ridiculous. And I hope one day that changes. I hope it's very quick. But, no, I don't have a fear of sharks. We see them from time to time. Uh, they are beautiful and absolutely necessary animals on our coast. Um, I, I have built up a respect for them, but, you know, I, I recount the story in, in Molokai when I swam with a 14-foot white tip for, for five hours, and that's a smart animal. You know, they're, they're top of their food chain, apex predators, but with that intelligence comes curiosity, and I'm absolutely convinced this shark was just curious as to what I was doing you know, what the hell is this? Uh, and it just followed under me really closely for five hours. And when I stopped to feed, it sat off to the side and just basked in the sun. Everybody in the boat could see it. It was a big animal. But at the start, when I saw it, I was a little, you know, it better be wary of that. Um, but very quickly, I was put at um, ease. And I never felt, I never picked up any bad or dangerous vibes from that beautiful animal. And that set me up, I think, for the swim's and that's how I can swim, you know, throughout a night anywhere without too much worry. Uh, 